Hello there, everybody. Welcome once again to Fun and Games Podcast. Uh, I'm Jeff Mona. I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. Now, there has been a lot of talk that's been going on about the Nintendo Switch. Mm -hmm. It was a very big deal when it was announced, like the full details of a new Nintendo console mere months before its release. It was kept under pretty tight lock and key. Yep. And then there was only a few months for everybody to have like a furor of speculation go on. And, you know, in its own way, it was meant to be a, pardon me, meant to be a game changer. Yeah. And so before the release of the Switch, Matt and I took some time and we recorded some thoughts of ours. We chatted a little bit back and forth about what we thought the console might be and how it might affect the landscape. Yeah, and um, we, unfortunately, due to timing of just getting the episode out and getting the podcast launch, we didn't get to release that speculative episode before the Switch actually came out. So our thought was um, to still give you that original episode after this little intro and then kind of cap it with actual uh, uh, reality of what the Switch can do since I now own one and Jeff has played it. Um, sort of an expectation of a game system versus reality and and actually owning the console. Because there's tons of console rumors as far as, you know, what the systems can do, can't do. You know, it can bake cookies and all of this crazy stuff. It prints money. Um, well, some of Nintendo systems actually seem the to The Nintendo do that. DS. Um, but this idea of still releasing that speculative episode because it was fun to speculate on what it's capable of and then talk about exactly the pros and cons of the Nintendo Switch and how I feel about it since I actually own one. And, you know, whether I think it's a worthwhile investment. Um, uh, spoiler alert, I think it is. But um, but yeah, I think it was just important to still release this episode, but maybe add something to it. So you're not just listening to our past selves ruminating over something that already is out. Honestly, I feel this makes for we, we backed ourselves into a little bit of serendipity because I really do enjoy comparing expectations before release versus after. And that's not even in video games. Some of my favorite things to look at as far as a. Uh, online history is backlash before release sure well you got to think about i mean the biggest place where that is right now is the mcu and most comic book movies in general like this backlash of as of when we're recording this intro the justice league trail full-length trailer just came out and people are already bashing the movie blah 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 and that's based on pre preconceived notions based on the mediocre previous two movies in that trilogy yeah so, my my two big uh, thoughts on those in movies and in video games was when Heath Ledger was revealed as the Joker in the oh, Dark sure. Knight. Compare and when the first gameplay screens of Zelda Wind Waker were released. I was at the front of the um, screaming mob at both of those, and I've not played Wind Waker, which I hear is a big disservice to myself because it actually does look amazing uh, post that. And I was the first person to go, God, that guy from Knight's Tale is going to be the Joker. This fucking sucks. And of course, now he's one of my favorite Jokers next to Mark Hamill. So clearly, I didn't know what the F I was talking about. And while time will still tell on the Nintendo Switch, uh, I'm, for one, am very happy to get to share our pre- and and post thoughts uh, on the Nintendo Switch release with you. Um, all right. So as far as what we're going to chat about today, so as of when we were recording, a lot more information is starting to flood our ears and eyes about the Nintendo Switch, the newest Nintendo system, which is apparently coming out in March, uh, which is shocking considering we only really started getting uh, as much details as we are towards the end of January, middle end of January when we're recording this. Um, and I wanted to take some time to chat about uh, handheld gaming and kind of handheld media in general, because the Nintendo Switch aims to shake that up a little. And I mean, if it's if not, Nintendo's not good for anything else, it's being a little bit gimmicky as they've been for like the last decade or so. Um, and I wanted to start by chatting about handheld gaming because both me and Jeff are very into that. We've had just about every handheld gaming console you can think of as far as the greatest hits go. There are a bajillion lesser known ones that we also own some of, but I think are less important for this conversation. Yeah, check Wikipedia for more info on those. But yeah, and the funny thing is, Nintendo has rather infamously or apocryphally or however you want to look at it, held the the reins of the handheld market. Everything has been, anything that's come out since 1989 has been about being different from Game Boy, toppling Game Boy, mm -hmm. or whatever Nintendo handheld is out at the time, mm -hmm. and being based off of that. You know, even trying to ignore it is still being a part of that 
environment one way or the other. It is the competition that needs to happen. I mean, uh, people look back at the PSP and probably see a commercial failure, yeah. whereas it actually was a fairly successful console. But you also have to compare to who else was in the room, and that was also the Nintendo DS, yeah. which... If you'll remember when it first came out, was a fairly gimmicky system. It was. Two screens. It had a touch screen where at the time you were looking at things like pack picks. Yeah. And feel the magic. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit of minigame happiness and a bit of just demonstrating the system. Demonstrating the fact that this was a new way to play. Yeah. And... Whereas PSP was coming out at the same time and was simply a graphical technological revolution or evolution yeah. of of gaming at the time. Yeah. Now, we know where that all went. Yeah. And it's very funny because sometimes, and I do mean sometimes, what starts off as gimmicky becomes part of the language of development or the language of the medium. Yeah, for sure. Other things just fall off. Um, we really haven't had much success with microphones in our uh, handheld systems. Certainly not yet. And yet Nintendo continues to put them there. Yeah, but, and many games where you have to blow into it to do something. Yes. Um, really, the most enjoyment I've ever gotten out of my DS's microphone was my Chatot in Pokemon Platinum, <laughs> which, hey, don't get me wrong. I like bird Pokemon and getting to have a parrot and I get to it says whatever I want. Fan freaking test. <laughs> whatever. Let's have some fun with that. But touch screens, that is an absolutely, um, you know, it feels gimmicky until you start working with it. Well, yeah, it's kind of a, a standard now with the 3DS XL and even with the the Vita and you know it, it on a lot of things. I mean, you mobile know, gaming. There's mobile gaming is all touchscreen technology. There are certain laptops that are touch touchscreen technology, and it continues to get better. Just like 3D was laughable at first, and although for the most part, everyone I know who owns a 3DS never uses the 3D, mostly to save battery life. M uh, when you do use the 3D and you're stationary and can look at it, it's pretty impressive technology, albeit still sort of unnecessary. But um, I think it's important to mention that since Nintendo has kind of led the charge for the longest time, it's interesting to me that they want to put out a console that either can be viewed as a handheld system that can also be plugged into a TV or a console that will also be used as a handheld gaming system. Either way, the thought behind that seems like maybe they don't want to continue to make handheld systems. They just want their console to be able to do both, which I mean... We're at a time where that's more likely to be able to happen. Also, it could be a view of Nintendo, no matter how its consoles have been doing, and they've had successful home consoles, and they've had less successful home consoles. <coughs> Virtual Boy. That was a handheld system, technically. Technically. Technically, that was a handheld system, and it was the least mobile ever. I can personally attest to that. Did you ever try wearing it? So when my friend first got it, there were two ways you could play it. You could either set it up on a table and kind of lean into it with a little stand or wear it. Wearing it gave you such neck pain and headaches. Like, it was impossible to play for more than a half hour. The way I found uh, most comfortable to play, and I actually did this quite a lot when I owned one, um... I would lie down. <laughs> I just rest I, it on your face? I would just rest it on my face. I would take it off the stand. I'd lie in my bed. I'd have the thing on my face. The button layout was honestly fantastic. You never needed to look at the buttons. That's, that is it was, true. It was great design there. And you know what? I would just play Wario Land for hours because really that was the game I had for Virtual Boy. I had Mario Tennis, but really I just... Wario Land was Wario was, Land. Was what shit. a game. And, no, and there were a lot of other games that were really good for Virtual Boy, but that was what I had. And... No, but despite the fact, however the home consoles were doing, yeah. the handhelds have always been a good, successful lifeblood for Nintendo. And this could also be seen as a means of pushing that handheld success into the home realm. Something to try to reclaim after everybody's view, certainly, of the Wii U. Yeah, well, because when the Wii U was announced and you saw this giant screen on the controller, everyone's like, oh, it's like a tablet. You're, and they showed people walking around their house playing the games and taking the game off the TV. Before more details were released, it was perceived as, oh, this is a mobile gaming system. Like, you can play on your TV or you can take it with you. It was only after, 
maybe right before or after release, people realized, oh no, you can just take it anywhere in your home it and even freeze the, up the TV. And even that, there was a limited range. Yeah, even then, only so far. I've tried to take my tablet fairly far in my home. I don't get very far. I mostly can sit elsewhere in my living room <laughs> to play virtual console games. Well, I mean, which wasn't a terrible idea because, no. I mean, me and my wife will often want to use the TV at the same time. And if she wanted to watch Netflix on our PS4, if we owned a Wii U, which I do not, but if we did, I could take the Wii U game I'm playing, whatever it is, put it on the pad, and then go into the dining room right next to the living room and continue playing, which is a good idea in theory. But unfortunately, Nintendo is not always quick to clear up what's unclear about their consoles. I mean, it's happened before, and I think the the biggest problem with the Wii U was that fact, that everyone really did think it was going to be portable. Now, you could say that the Switch is an answer to that, which it very well might be. What I'm still not sure about, and I don't know if they've said up until this point, is will you be... I'm pretty sure they said you're going to be able to play both the Switch games on the move and possibly whatever the handheld system is, the 3DS games from the past, that kind of stuff. Which if it has that kind of backwards compatibility, opening uh, people who don't own a 3DS up to 3DS games on their Switch, I think that's a pretty neat idea. And Nintendo has always had backwards compatibility in mind, certainly for their handheld systems. Yes. And the digital marketplace, they've had hits and misses. Yeah. But they've always kept it in mind. Yeah, I mean, on my 3DS, the fact that I've paid $4 for Kirby when I can uh, not illegally emulate it on my PC, sometimes it bugs me. But then again, I mean, I'd rather have it on my 3DS and be able to take it with me, especially if it's a game I really love, like the first Super Mario Land or the second one, because they were both great. Um, you know, but just the same, I feel like backwards compatibility is a thing that becomes more and more convoluted as we continue with consoles. I mean, like... The Xbox One on launch didn't allow you to play Xbox 360 games, and then they re changed it after the fact. PS4, you still can't play PS3 games, that kind of stuff. Whereas Nintendo also would only go so far back. Like, I believe the Wii could play GameCube games, but the Wii U could only play Wii games and not GameCube games. Correct. And so, you know, we're getting to a point where PC becomes the best home console because you have backwards compatibility if you have a Steam account. However, going back to the Nintendo Switch's function, if it's designed to function as equally a home console and a portable console, I think that could be really interesting and I'm excited about it. I just feel like also, if it leans more towards mobile, the price point at $299.99 or $300, $300. Is, is, a, is steep for handheld. I mean, the handheld systems are only going to get more expensive anyway, but still... If it primarily serves more as a handheld system, that's a lot of money. However, if it's primarily designed to serve as a home console that has handheld, that's actually not a bad price tag. So it depends on how you look at it. And it depends on which markets they are leaning towards. Yeah. Because some of the gimmicky stuff we were talking about before, like, you know, touch screens, that is now every handheld system worth its salt yeah I has mean, a touch screen. Your Vita has one. Your 3DS has one. Your phone, your tablet Everything has a touchscreen. So that is now mm -hmm. part of the language of handheld gaming. Mm -hmm. And so you are competing with phones. You're competing with the games that people don't even realize are really games. Yeah. Um, you know, your your match threes, your runners, your uh, word games, your and anything else that's on somebody's phone, that's on somebody's tablet, that's, you know, the sort of things that I see on my morning commute. Yeah. Um, those are games that you're competing with. And so... It's kind of interesting to see that market as well. And honestly, tablets and phones are not cheap. No. But they are also things that are seen as tools, as utilities, as something yeah. you take with you. And there's this is not a new part of the debate. The idea of has something like the Vita or the 3DS become obsolete because of phone gaming and especially with the release of Super Mario Run? The short answer is no because Super Mario Run is actually not very good. No, it's not. But um, but also that brings up an interesting point. If the Switch, the Switch essentially when it comes out of the console base is a tablet, will it have tablet functionality? Because I haven't seen that anywhere. Like, will you have a a home base to come back to, sort of like the home screen on the 3DS, but like you have a web browser, you have, you can download apps for it. Like if they treat it like a tablet that's also a game console and a portable console, I mean, that could be huge. I mean, considering how much an iPad costs, if 
the Nintendo system can do the same thing, but without iTunes or any of the stuff that's proprietary. That's pretty incredible. And Nintendo has definitely in the past developed almost gimmicky seeming yet really powerful software mm-hmm. that is art studios, that is messaging software, yep. that is a lot of it, like the Flipnote Studio yeah. and anything like that. If you and those are their own brands, yeah, and that is their own design. Big ups to Picto Chat. I loved Picto Chat. There you go. Um, but yeah, no, they always created that kind of stuff, and they still do for the 3DS. I mean, uh, what is it? Pokemon Shuffle is essentially a mobile game, but for the 3DS. I mean, hell, you can buy Cut the Rope, which is a popular mobile game, on the 3DS. Um, mm-hmm. So they're not immune to that kind of stuff. I think it's interesting. I'm just worried about Nintendo also killing their own market. I mean. Like we were talking about earlier, Nintendo has always been the strongest handheld system. Um, and if they, if the new console is designed to be instead of a new 3DS or whatever is next after the 3DS, what happens then? Are they done with handhelds? I mean, also the point I brought up before about will 3DS games be able to be played on the the Switch? Well, two things: a, will it split the screen on its own, and b. Will there be a 3D functionality? I mean, the 2DS exists, and that doesn't have it. You can still play the 3DS games, so it could be something like that. But I'm afraid that as a fan of Nintendo handhelds and have played pretty much every one of them, and even some non-Nintendo ones, I would be sad to not have a new Game Boy, 3DS, or whatever the next iteration is. Well, the things to remember is, again, when the, the DS first came out, it was not touted as the replacement to the Game Boy. That's true. It was the third pillar of their strategy. They had Game Boy, they had the Wii, and they had the DS. Now, looking back, this was definitely a very safe strategy to take where they could go, so if this DS thing doesn't work, we still have the glory of the Game Boy line, and we can just keep running with that. But thankfully, it worked out. Right. I mean, it's a shame, though, because it did kill the backwards compatibility of it because the original DS and DS Lite both let you play Game Boy Advance games, and Game Boy games, Game Boy Color too, I think. But then, of course, oh, once, only Advance. Oh, only Advance. But once we moved past that, you eventually they just filtered that out too. And when the 3DS came out, it didn't even have that slot. Well, for the first few uh, iterations of the Game Boy, it was actually a hardware uh, ability. Ah. They had the the proper processors. They had everything in there. It wasn't like it is now, where they pretty much have software emulation to make it right. happen. It was this will read this cartridge because we have everything to read the cartridge. It's much right. like the Super Game Boy was, where it was this is essentially a Game Boy without the screen and right. everything built into a Super NES cartridge. So it's, it's reading it. It's not software playback. Right. It is. It is almost organic playback in a weird way. I mean, clearly now the DS line is where it went. The Game Boy did essentially die as far as a console, and now you can get them on the virtual console, which, I mean, we saw that direction happening anyway because there were so many downloadable games on the generation of 360, PS3, and uh, the Wii. All of them had game emulation and game download. So we knew that was the direction it was heading. But again, like, you know... And I'm someone who's always bought the new Nintendo system, except for the Wii U. The Wii U is the first one I didn't buy on release and have yet to buy. But every other console generation of Nintendo from the Nintendo Entertainment System, I bought more or less on release. And so now with the Switch like the Wii U, I'm hesitant because even though there are some positive uh, play experiences coming out, I'm afraid that it's still going to be littered with disappointment. I mean, graphically, it I'm heard it looks pretty, but it's not necessarily as powerful as... Again, they're coming out at the same time as the PS4 and the Xbox One existing, and so that means the next generation of Xbox and PlayStation will come out after this system. And so it always feels like they're behind graphically and processor-wise. But that's something that Nintendo has always done. And there's, yeah. a, and there's a couple of things that I'm thinking on here, one of which is the fact that, yes, Nintendo has... Um, sort of always, but certainly in the last 10 years, really dug its heels in about the fact of they're not really caring about the, the highest numbers. Yeah. In a sense, it's all about the game. Yeah. And for lack of anything else, uh, buying a Nintendo console is a great entry fee into playing all of their fantastic IPs. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's, I mean, that was another thing I wanted to bring up is that they hold on to most of those IPs so tightly that that's always what in the end, sells a Nintendo system. It's smart. It's You could be like, oh, well, you're only going to get five games for it. Yeah, but you are going to want those five games. And won't you buy the system to get it? Yeah. And there's a few things that are interesting here. Because for one thing, uh, 
the Game Boy line survived for so long because they weren't chasing the best numbers. Really, the number they were chasing was battery life. Yeah. They wanted a long-lasting, practical system. Things that were designed so that you could play them on a car trip, play mm-hmm. them on the train, play them wherever. It's going to be durable. There's, you know, that infamous Game Boy that survived a shell bombing in the <laughs> Gulf War that's a Nintendo crazy. World in Midtown. Yeah, that's Fantastic. crazy. What a great design philosophy. Mm-hmm. And so it's not necessarily creating the most immersive, amazing experience, but it's creating a great gaming experience and one that you don't have to worry about whether your battery life is or anything else. So that's kind of the niche they carved. And even if they get a bit gimmicky in how they play one way or the other, it is still about a good game. Now, the fact that the Nintendo Switch is what it is, Mm -hmm. uh, sort of a crossover system, is a very big acknowledgement that the lines are getting blurred yeah. with tablet games, with mobile games, with cross-buy on your PS4 to Vita. Mm-hmm. The fact that the idea of a, the Wii U gamepad being able to something you can take around your house, mm. honestly, the PS Vita, PS4 has done a better job of that nowadays. Sure, yeah, or something like the PS TV, which was meant to be for homes with multiple TVs. I live in a one-bedroom apartment. I have one TV. Yeah. Other places, that's a fantastic investment. You sure. can get all that going on. And it's because it has the more powerful host system to work from elsewhere. Um, But we'll see how the blurring of lines that Nintendo is taking here plays out. And unfortunately, the past few generations of Nintendo systems have been plagued by wait and see, uh, by consumers, by developers, by a lot of people. I mean... I still remember very distinctly the Capcom 5 of GameCube. Capcom was very interested in the GameCube and developing Mm -hmm. for the GameCube. And they promised five exclusive uh, games developed for and only for the GameCube. Now, one of those games was canceled. Dead Phoenix, a shooter game, very uh, Star Fox, Panzer Dragoon style. The fact that it doesn't exist in any form is a great disappointment to me. I love those kind of games. Um, I really do, and I would love to talk about that more later. Um, and just about everything else they made, uh, if it was any good, it got ported. And yeah. there was there was a lot of delays. I mean, the first one was Project Number 03, PN03, which, um, an odd little game. I kind of like it. Beautiful Joe, Resident Evil 4, yeah. and Killer7. Yeah. And so those all kind of moved around, and that was, I feel like that, right there is kind of been a, a global attitude towards Nintendo systems for the last 10, 15 years, I'd say. Well, yeah, the biggest thing that I think hurt the Wii U and the GameCube was that the the lack or limited third-party support. I mean, the Wii and the Wii U, it's less so with the Wii U because the Wii U does have a lot of ports that are actually really good. I've heard that the their ports of the Arkham games actually did very well, but in the Wii's life cycle nobody could program for this thing because if you had a game that was on every other console for the Wii it had to have motion control and so you had to flub through that um and it I remember playing Spider-Man 3 I think um for the Wii U after playing it for the Xbox 360 probably and on the Xbox 360 you have a controller you control Spider-Man all the problems that game had the controls were fine on the Wii instead you had to flick the Wiimote, like you're shooting webbing. Now, initially, feels very cool. But after playing the game for an hour, you want to break your hand off. It's just, it's not feasible. And I think that's what really hurt them in the past. Whereas the Switch is touting that it's going to be fully third-party compatible. It's going, you know, tons of people want to develop for it. If that's the case, that's going to be huge. That's what will define the success, I think. And you brought up something that I think is going to work in the Switch's favor. The fact that, you know what's, uh, you know what I'm not really noticing? Mm. There's no motion control. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's some gyroscopic to it because yeah. they've got the technology, but... And everything th- has gyroscopics now. At this point, yeah. Why not? Uh, throw it in. Again, it's one of those. It's part of the language. It's almost expected. You need, yeah. the, you need analog control. You need a touch screen. You need these things. Otherwise, people are going to go, well, where's the beef? <laughs> and... God, we're old. Anyway, the fact that it is a handheld system... That can go onto the TV. That means you can't really have a Wii mode anymore. You yeah. have the Joy Cons now. They do have motion control. Yeah. They have that haptic feedback. They have the 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 subtleties of a drink being poured. But still, and all, it is 
while there have been pro controllers yeah. for the Wii, the Wii U, and there are pro controllers now for the that are coming out for the Switch, it is a more the control experience for the Switch is a lot closer to your conventional control experience with the Nintendo je ne sais quoi. Right. And the fact that it has a more handheld style approach to what it has at its disposal, the touch screen, the the feedback, the everything else, its motion control feels more gyroscopic yeah. than pointing it at the TV. Right. And I think before we get into our closing statements on how we feel about the Switch and whether we'll actually buy it just for you know peace of mind, I think that's the important distinction that will define the Switch's success is previous iterations of the more recent Nintendo consoles, specifically the Wii and the Wii U, the gimmicks were for control. The controls were the gimmick, the touchscreen, the, the motion control, all of that stuff. The gimmick for the Switch is utility and just utility. Can you play it at home? Can you play it on the go? And I think that's a much stronger starting point. The 3DS's success is because originally it was gimmicky about the 3D, but then it became the utility utility of both screens and a lot of games don't even have that much 3d the pokemon the new pokemon game sun and moon have almost no 3d in them because it's not about that they have none actually oh sun it is and, none sun and moon because it is such a tax on the system itself and because it plays on both the regular 3ds and the new 3ds they have there's, there's none no 3d there is no 3d programmed into it but in the previous version um um, an X and Y and an, an Alpha and Sapphire and Omega Ruby. They had 3D, but pretty much only in the battles and the opening cutscene. That was it. Everything else was was non 3D. And I think it's because you know people are realizing the utility of the console and its lifespan and its its power and how long it can last and the the spot pass technology beyond the gimmicky 3D, which is still there, but not every game uses. And I think that's going to be in the Switch's favor, is that it's designed and based around the utility. It's called the Switch because you can switch from independent local co-op, indep- uh, attached to TV, local and online co-op, and take it with you like a handheld console. And I think that if it's successful, it'll be because all of those features work really well. I mean, in the commercial, I remember them propping it up like a tablet and then using four controllers locally sitting around it now of course it's a tiny screen comparatively so an old man like me i'm not gonna be able to see a damn thing but that said it's still this idea that you're they're promoting local co-op again which is something i feel is dead and we can talk on that at a later date but um also it's again promoting the utility of the system not hey here's a gimmick that changes how you interact with the game and i think that's really important for it and yet it is still changing how you game and how right. you play it. Now, the big question that I have that will sort of determine if and when I buy it mm-hmm. is purchasing a second unit. Yeah. Now, it's three ninety nine for the Switch, mm-hmm. the two Joy-Cons, which uh, we discussed before recording. I love that name. Yeah. Uh, it's nice. It's quick. And you know yeah. exactly. It's, it's, it's as ubiquitous as Wiimote. And yeah. there's something very nice about that, as well as the base station and what have you. Now, one of the big holdups in my home for purchasing a Nintendo handheld is do we have enough for two? Yeah. And because I want to play it and my wife wants to play it. And that's this is why we need to have two 3DSs in the house. We tried it with one once. Yeah. Um, we need two. And so, depending upon price points and ease of use and switching back and forth and having two Switch main tablets yeah. that can be shared beyond. And I'm sure that's a question that will come up in households where you're buying this for kids. Yeah. And wondering about that. That's going to be a big make or break as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And if it's the sort of thing where it's 300 for all of this and then 100 for another uh, Switch tablet, and that may well be what it is and I'm just whatever um, – I could go for that because yeah. what that then becomes is that's $200 for a home console and two handheld systems. Yeah. And that is a very nice value. And it may well be something where the Switch pays off really nicely for um, buying in bulk in yeah. a sense. If you are getting these multiple handhelds, the handheld itself to buy in at first is a little pricey. Yeah. And then after that, everybody has a switch and you know they just fight over who gets the tv but that's not a new fight no yeah and for me in my household i'm the primary gamer my wife does play games but 
she's she doesn't spend as many hours gaming as I do. So for me, the the real thing would have to be if it's a if it's a portable console, is it replacing my 3DS or is it something to have as a home console that is also in tandem with my 3DS or you know besides my 3DS? Because that's going to make the big difference. If the portability is really great and I really can just take. Skyrim, for example, if playing Skyrim or something that graphically powerful at home on the TV and then take it on the tablet and still continue to play it, that'll sell it for me pretty instantly. But it it still got to have um, it. I have to know if it's usurping my 3DS or not, which is still not clear because I love my 3DS. I don't play it nearly as much as I used to, but I still play it quite a bit. But I have this thing about playing portable systems at home. I do it, but it's a psychological thing, whereas I feel like the Switch may blur that a little bit. And so ultimately, I mean, we're recording this only a couple of months before it comes out and our tune could completely change in a few months. But for me, for now, I'm not sold on it yet. I need more information. That- I also need to know first party titles besides Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which is enough, but I need more than that. Am I going to get a proper Metroid title on this system? Am I going to get a proper... Uh, Mario title in the system, which the answer is yes, but it's when and how. Did you see the trailer for Super Mario Odyssey? I did not. I want Super Mario Odyssey. I want Super Mario Odyssey and I want the new Zelda. I've been wanting a Zelda like that for years. So, honestly... Uh, you might notice, I've been speaking fairly positively about the Nintendo Switch because you know what? I'm... I'm a little bit of a Nintendo mark. I know that. Yeah. And they're hitting my buttons. And I also understand that this could be a piece of a... I'm also somebody who has a number of systems. So yeah. this is one system among many. And that's not for everybody. Yeah. And I'm excited. I remain cautiously excited. I think both... I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm skeptical. Like seeing a trailer for Sonic Mania, which looks great. But we've been, um, you we've know, done that like, dance with Sonic, right? Yeah, Sonic Four, which was also really great, got one, ep- two episodes, and then discontinued, and it was supposed to be like a whole series of games. So I'm cautiously optimistic about this console, but again, I, I still think I need some more convincing. Um, Fair enough. A feeling of return to form. Is- your mention of Sonic reminded me. It's like, yeah. uh, uh, speaking of a return to form in gaming, feels a lot like a New Year's resolution. Yeah. If you keep it up, great, but. The first one, that's cool and all. Yes. Uh- well, I hope you all enjoyed this little trip down memory lane of a few months ago. Yes, we certainly did. Um, but I think it's important to touch on, you know, actually what the Switch can do and how, how we feel about it. And I mean, I'll start with some cons on the system. You know, overall, I am enjoying the fact that I have it. I'm loving Zelda and I'm neck deep in it at this point. But um, there's a, their interface, you know, a big thing about gaming these days, and we'll probably talk, touch on this more in detail later, is, you know, interfaces and online support and pretty much all of the other things a console does besides being a console and my first nitpick about the switch already is that they're still using the friend code thing which i get from a system geared geared towards kids you don't want creepy strangers just friending your kids online and i understand that so i'm an adult and i don't want creepy people friending me yeah and so like the friend code i get this time they've changed it though where if you have one person's friend code you're friends you don't have to they just have to accept the request they don't have to also input their your friend code on their system which is great um they also linked it to uh, mitomo which is the uh, phone app where you can do stuff with your me if you had friends on that if you have a Nintendo, a my Nintendo account, and both things are linked, you get suggested friends based on your friends there, which is also useful. That's fantastic. Um, so the friends list uh, s- feature seems more intuitive as far as finding friends this time around. Um, but my biggest complaint is you can literally not interact with your friends at all. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, you can see if they're online, um, and you can see what they're playing. But you can't send them a message. You can't voice chat with them. You can't comment on what they're playing. You literally can do nothing. You can view your friends list. That's it. And that's a huge uh, detractor to me for online gaming. Now, I imagine with Mario Kart just around the corner being re-released, that may change. And I'm sure they'll have interface updates as they always do on online consoles, consoles that connect to the internet. But I'm a little miffed that I can literally do nothing about my friends list. They're just there. It seems kind of pointless. And it's a, a, a bit of an, a bit irksome to me, but I guess it'll matter more once I start playing some multiplayer games. Absolutely. I mean, Breath of the Wild, it doesn't matter as much who else is online. No, for sure not. I know people are playing. Good for them. I'm too busy finding shrines. Um, so at uh, the moment, that works. This, this almost seems like a good strategy. Put that out there. Make this... Because at the moment, essentially... 
the Switch feels like a Zelda machine, a well, portable Zelda machine. Pretty much. I mean, there's deal. So the, the online store, I will say, as a pro, is much better. It's reminiscent of the 3DS. So if you had one, it's the same kind of Nintendo eShop. Um, it, it, it's funny. Um, we know, I know now why Nintendo partnered with the iPhone to release its first Mario game, because the browser that the eShop uses is Safari. And I think that's very interesting. Um, but the, the shops thorough um, Neo Geo dumped a ton of their games on there. So if you're a fan of Metal, Metal Slug or Final Fight or um, Samurai Showdown, you can get all those kinds of games. Also, um, the creators of Shovel Knight released a all-inclusive DLC Treasure Trove version, which I'm excited to get eventually. So the, the online store has some options for a brand new system, but, you know, probably could still use some expansion as well. Absolutely. And while it is still very early days, for the system uh there's only been a few releases um i don't hear certainly from where i am i don't hear a lot of grumbling about that i mean certainly it feels more like a bright future because i mean this this has happened in the past with nintendo consoles where it sounds as though some companies have support and then they kind of gradually ghost and i'm gonna i'll see you later Uh, It feels as though people are digging in on their support, and I see a lot more online content and commentary and uh, conversation where people are even waiting and seeing on future game releases right now because they're waiting for the Switch version. People are excited about when it's coming out for the Switch, and it seems companies are hearing that. And certainly on the independent level and on some of the AAA level, too, they are making it for the Switch. And getting... Getting our hands on it. We were talking about this before we recorded today. Uh, the fact that while there are some of the more nintendo e controls, there is motion control, there is all of that, it's far more uh, segmentable mm-hmm. from the full-on gaming experience. Having Neo Geo throw their hat in with their backlog yeah. sort of makes this a fun, portable arcade experience and truly is like... What one might argue is the, you know, and I'm doing big air quotes here, pure gaming experience. Right. Being able to play local co-op is a big deal. And the Switch is designed for that because if you pull off the two parts of the controller on the side of the system while it's portable, it has a kickstand to lean up and you can use each each half of the controller as its own controller for certain games. And frankly, being able to carry that much of a system so easily from place to place, um, I wish I could tell my 12-year-old self that when, when I was packing my PS1 all of the wires, all of the controllers, <laughs> all of the games in a backpack. This is this is the future, people. It's a wonderful thing. Well, yeah, and what's funny about the Switch itself is the, the holster that connects it to the TV is literally an HDMI cable that plugs into a base and a micro SD cord that also plugs into a base. So if you wanted to bring the system somewhere with you, the, the, the base that it plugs into is very portable, or you could just unjack the power cord from the stand and take that with you with the portable part of the system. Um, it's also exciting because um, Capcom's jumping in on the kind of improving previous stuff, and they're releasing an ultimate version of Super Street Fighter 2 with new features unique to the Switch, which I think is really cool and interesting, taking an, a, you know a 16-bit game and or 32-bit, I depend. I suppose, depending on the version you bought huh. and uh, upgrading it a little bit, but essentially keeping the original content like it's the same pit of fighters, except they're adding Akuma. They're adding evil Ryu. They're adding evil Ken to the roster of what was already a great roster in Super Street Fighter 2. Um, also, this unique feature where you can select the special moves using buttons on the controller instead of inputting them, which for newcomers to fighting series, make it more like Smash Brothers, which could be a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I've, I've definitely seen that feature in some other games happen. Uh, actually, in Battle Arena Toshinden, which yeah. is a fighting series that I don't know how many people remember that one. But that you had the option of uh, mapping the shoulder buttons to special moves, which is, you know, fun in and of itself. Yeah, for sure. I think that, um, you know, another pro to the system is, you know, some people are complaining. Je- uh, Jeff man- mentioned briefly the back catalog and the fact that there's a couple of full release titles. But because Zelda is over 100 hours plus and, um, you know, Zelda games are meant to be in depth and I am a working professional who has multitudes of jobs and podcasts, I don't have a ton of time to play games. So a 100 hour game is going to keep me busy for a long time. Like Mario Kart, as I said, is coming out imminently as we record this. I'm not going to get it right away. I don't have time to play Mario Kart. You know, they're eventually releasing Smash Brothers, the Wii U version, but with all of the DLC characters and stages, which I think is brilliant. It's going to expose... 
a new generation of gamer for the new console to older games, but they'll still feel new because they'll have DLC that some people might not have purchased back then. It lends itself towards those so-called definitive editions. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's something very nice, uh, also speaking as a working professional, one who has to travel around a fair amount, certainly within New York City, it is very nice to see that that idea of being able to play a game on the subway or on your commute and get home and continue playing it on your TV, that works as well as advertised. Yeah, and it, it was one of those things that like I wasn't sure about in our episode and that the fact that it works as advertised makes me so happy. It's absolutely satisfying to come home from work after playing Switch on the train, but I have to walk then, stop playing to walk from the train station to my house and then plug it right into the console base as soon as I get home and keep playing without missing a beat. It's really awesome. Absolutely. And as somebody who does a lot of handheld and console gaming, it there is a certain in your head, um, I don't want to be playing my 3DS at home. I play yeah, that when I'm out and I about. I do that all the time, and, yeah. I, and I still do sometimes, but only if I'm like really focused on a game. But mm-hmm. for the most part, it, it feels odd it feels out of place the switch doesn't feel so out of place doing that it is meant to be in all around all over throughout gaming experience and i think people are noticing that and you know while as we spoke of previously um other systems other companies have been getting at that have been working within their framework and structure to facilitate that um I, i remember mentioning sony um the fact is this is it. Yeah. And this experience may improve over time or, or support may drop out or anything else. But you know what? Uh, as a piece of technology, as a proof of concept, it works. Yeah. I think there'll definitely be bugs to work out. But I think also the fact that it has a kickstand, you can use the controllers individually. The fact that like um, it comes with a plastic holster essentially for your controller pieces to feel like a solid controller and is comfortable to hold um you know one of the other negatives i'll touch on is the short battery life which is every console the 3ds when it first came out its battery life was terrible um but you there was an on mark an off-brand battery that you could buy and, and attach to it to extend the battery life and then shortly after that they did release the 3ds xl which had a better battery life and i imagine they'll do something similar for this if it's an attachable battery pack i'll buy it if it's a new version of the system it won't be for a few years but that said you get a solid two to two and a half hours my commute is never going to be longer than that um and again the cable is very portable so most a lot of modern flights have outlets that you can plug into so it's not really a huge detractor i think it just is a bit of a bummer that yeah if you're on a long car ride you know with no outlet in your car you you can only play for a few hours and then it dies bringing back the car adapters the car adapters which do exist still for for cell phones and things because um it's it's a USB charge. Yeah. It's US, then you're gonna then you're gonna be fine there. We yeah. live in a world nowadays where the notion that you're gonna have to charge a device is all pervasive. It's yeah. not just the nerds who need to charge up a single device. Everybody walks around with a phone. Yeah. Everybody's walking around with devices that typically have a USB into a brick kind of charge. So yeah. some some places nowadays even have it. Just plug the dang USB port into the wall and you're going to get a charge. Mm-hmm. So that's not as big of a deal. I know one of the hardware issues going on right now is having the system on its kickstand and charging it at the same time because the charging port is on the, on the bottom, bottom of the system. So it's kind of impossible to do that at this point, unless yeah. you have some kind of magic table with a hole in the middle. Right. And we have nothing new to add to that subject, but simply noting that there are there are hiccups. There are yeah. design flaws. There are pieces that are, this is Nintendo. This is a system. Yeah. It's going to be updated. It's going to be worked on. You know, this is this is truly early days. We're in the first six months of its release. And I can already foresee a battery pack where it plugs into the bottom um, like the, you know, sort of in the same place where the console holster would plug in and then there's a power port on the side or something that you plug in. I don't know. I can foresee them doing that, so I'm sure that's not too far away. Um, something that we talked about in the speculative a- episode because I thought it would be cool and it turned out to not be true is that there were rumors that you would be able to play your 3DS games on the Switch, which is not the case. Um, there is an SD card slot um, that or micro SD card slot, which is required for additional storage. Um, if you're not downloading games, you have plenty of storage on the device. 
But if you're going to be downloading a bunch of games, you will want an SD card and you can get them micro SD cards for a decent price at this point. So that's not too much of an expense. Um, it is a little bit disappointing that I can't play my 3DS games on it only because this is easily going to circumvent my 3DS. Because again, of the thing you mentioned, like I never played my 3DS at home because it felt weird. It was designed for commuting and I didn't want to finish a game at home and then have nothing to play on my commute. Absolutely. This, since it's co commingled, like I'm hoping they put out a spot pass feature for it, which they haven't yet, only because I do love that feature on the 3DS. Um, but yeah, no 3DS games on the Switch, which is fine because I mean, again, I'm going to be playing Zelda for this foreseeable future anyway. And there'll be solutions. You know, you you might have to pay out the nose for it every now and again. But the the games that are important, even if you can't carry over your whole library, yeah, those games you want to revisit. Well, yeah, and I mean, I'm keeping my 3DS and, you know, I have some old DS games that I kept that play on the 3DS and so on and so forth. And so, like, that's not going to go anywhere. It's just for now, it's not a portable system I'm going to go to. But as a whole, I would highly recommend the Switch. Um, I think it's a worthwhile purchase. I don't necessarily like uh, here. So here's the quick pitch. If you're not a Zelda fan, don't buy the system. There's no reason. Uh, so Shovel Knight's not going to be enough. But if you're a Zelda fan or just a gaming fan in general who wants to dive into a Zelda game, this would be the one to start with. It feels wholly unique. It feel, it, you know, at the same time, it feels wholly retro because it is this kind of open adventure that you're not, you're only partially guided on. Um, and I think it's worth it for the length, the amount of time you can spend with the system. Um, if you're looking for a multiplayer experience, it's not an early, in early days, it's not really worth it. Sni Snipper Clips is okay. You know, one, two switch isn't worth the $60 price tag. It's, I happen to really like Poyo Pop Tetris, but that's... Poyo um, Pop Tetris is fun. We played the demo together. It reminded me of how terrible I am at Tetris. Uh, um, I, I'm in a marriage where um, some arguments have been settled using Bust to Move and things like that. <laughs> so I, I, I definitely enjoyed it. But um, again... That's that's me. It's a fun game, and if you like those kinds of games, then yes, it's absolutely worth it for the multi multiplayer. And once Mario Kart's out, if you're looking for a major multiplayer experience, that'll be great because it'll have all the DLC stages and characters. Um, and of course, I'm looking forward to Smash Brothers because I'm a Smash Brothers addict. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that it's really a multiplayer system yet. I think that's still a wait and see uh, aspect. Um, but if you want a solid single player system that you can play on your commute and at home it's gorgeous and it works really well i mean a lot of people are complaining that it's not at, uh, on par with some of the modern hd gaming systems but nintendo's always been stylized and games like splatoon and arms and the new zelda look great and i you know i think the more realistic games are going to look great too also touching back to the third party thing that you mentioned um there's a game called ukulele that just came out as we speak which is by the creators of banjo kazooie and banjo tooie um which i'm really excited about and i found out very recently that later this year it'll be out for the switch and so that's a game i'd wait for on the switch and an example of a third party developer that was developing for the wii u saw the switch coming and went we're going to cancel development on this and work on the switch version because this is the future of this console life cycle at least so yeah it's it's definitely a very strong wait and see kind of system it is yeah. worth early adopting if it has something that appeals to you it certainly has something that appeals to me it's a matter of time before i get one right it looks as though that all of the nintendo staples are coming out yeah and now last generation we had a bit of wii u 3ds confusions things like smash brothers yeah but that is being mitigated it's gone now because it's all one system yeah and it looks as though the third parties are actually taking notice yeah. and that's also a bit of a wait and see for you're not seeing it strongly now but you're seeing a lot of support yeah and just you wait it'll come out yeah because i think being uh, you know ultimately and this is one of the biggest third party celebrations was the fact that i think it's later this year skyrim is being released on the switch the idea of being able to take skyrim wherever you go is kind of daunting but also awesome and if other third party developers jump on like that i mean it'll be my system of choice yes the graphics may not be as perfect but like now i really have no reason to play anything but my pc and my switch because you know, if it's coming out on the PS4 and the Switch, well, if I get it on the Switch, it's portable. So why would I get it on the PS4 um, unless it's a Sony specific title? And so or I you like getting trophies, right? Um, and I'm sure the Nintendo will have some kind of achievement system eventually. I mean, they all do. They all do. And if not, a lot of the games that uh, boast achievements on other consoles will have in game achievements, you know, or uh, Meg later Mega Man games had in game achievements, you know, and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. so those are things to look forward to also. But honestly, the achievement thing is not a thing I'd thought about when playing the Switch. 
but I do like getting achievements, but that ship has kind of sailed. Like, I'm not super as into it as I was on the 360. Because, again, like a gamer score and anything else, it doesn't transfer with the system. So I've for kind of forgotten about it. Yeah. After the initial excitement, you go, but it's stuck here. Yeah. So uh, all in all, I recommend the Switch as uh, an owner and a player. Um, but, yeah, if you're looking for a grand multiplayer experience or something other than Zelda, wait till the holidays. Um, otherwise, if you're a Zelda fan... Hands down, get the system. Absolutely. And if it's one of those situations where you're not sure, like you have a Wii U, but you think you're going to get a Switch and you're not sure, well, maybe I can get Breath of the Wild on the Wii U, which is the situation I'm in. I'm waiting for the Switch because yeah. I know I'm going to get the Switch and I know I want to play this game. I have, I've, I've played brief spurts of it and it's done nothing but wow me. So I'm, I'm going to wait and see on that. Once I get the Switch is when I'm going to get Zelda. So it's awesome. just what it is. Awesome. All right. Well, um, thank you for listening. As always, you can find us on the internets in most places um, at fun and games pod. Our email address is at is fun and games pod at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Um, shout out to the cartridge blowers group on Facebook. Um, thank you for listening. We appreciate you guys um, very much. So um, we encourage you to submit uh, suggestions for topics, ideas, things to discuss on the show, even questions for us. We would love to hear from you. Um, we're, of course, on Facebook.com slash Pod as well. We're trying to create a community there. Feel free to post things about gaming that you're interested in or other things. You know, we have other nerd-adjacent things we're really into also. Um, also, of course, check us out on iTunes and Google Play. Rate and review us if you're a listener because it helps us get featured in the future. And thank you for listening. Absolutely. One last time, I am Jeff Moonen. And I am Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And happy gaming.